Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to Shuttleworth. My name's Paul Shakespeare, and I'm going to talk to you this morning uh, for about 15, 20 minutes about this magnificent aircraft behind me, the, uh, the Royal Aircraft Factory SE5A. Many of you will know a lot of details about this aircraft. Uh, what I hope I'll be able to bring you today is some, something a little bit different, which is about what it's like to actually fly. Because I've been flying this aircraft for a few years now, uh, and to me, it's and it's one of my absolute favorites in the collection. It's, uh, I can see why it was as popular as it was. It was known by some as the Spitfire of World War I. Of course, it wasn't known at the time because that didn't exist. But it, later on, it became known as that. And uh, I can tell you, in comparison to its peer aircraft at the time, it's an absolutely superb aircraft to fly. Uh, great performance, very nice to handle. It's a stable aircraft. It's rock solid. So, you know, very structurally strong uh, and very fast. And all those things, plus the fact it was well armoured, uh, made it a very effective fighter. So where to start? Some, sometimes confuse, confusing because it's known as the RAF SE-5A. That was the Royal Aircraft Factory uh, who were at Farnborough, not the Royal Air Force, which didn't come into being until the 1st of April, 1918. The aircraft was designed by uh, a chap, well, in fact, it was a team of people, but principally by a, a very famous designer called Henry Folland, uh, working with John Kenworthy and also one of the pilots, um, uh, Major Gooden, Major Frank Gooden. Uh, they'd they'd learned a lot in previous years. If you have to, you have to take it back to the time of the aircraft that were in service at the time. They were the very early World War One fighters, some of which you can see around us uh, today. Thing, but things like the BE-2C, things like the Sopwith Pup uh, and, and other such aircraft, the, uh, the RE-8. And, and they were pretty poor by comparison with this. You probably have heard about things like the, uh, the Fokker Scourge and, uh, and Bloody April, some of these uh, disastrous times that uh, the Royal Flying Corps were having in World War I. <clears throat> and so there was a need for a, a faster, better armed, easier to fly aircraft and this was one of the solutions. Uh, so the aircraft first flew um, right at the end of uh, 1916, but the first deliveries weren't until 1917. And that was that was the that aircraft then at the time was the SE5, as opposed to this SE5A. Uh, the SE5 was powered by a um, 150 horsepower geared engine. Hispano Suiza engine, and they were very problematic. There were, there were lots of reliability and supply problems with that engine. And the aircraft wasn't particularly successful. I think there were only a handful built. There were certainly less than 100 SE5s built before they made the change to move on to the, the SE5A. Uh, the SE5A, the advent of the SE5A was a more powerful engine, uh, and the Hispano Suiza, they, they came up with a 180 horsepower version. Uh, some of those were built under license, um, such as this aircraft here. And I should have said at the beginning, this is the world's last remaining uh, genuine SE5A. There are a number of replicas around, but this one is the last real one. Uh, and when you think there are over 5,000 built, um, that's, that's a hell of a shame, but we're incredibly honored to have this aircraft. So yeah, about 5,000 built. So we moved on to the, the SE5A, which was, uh, a stronger aircraft, um, it had a bigger engine, so it had better performance. If we go back to the, the prototypes, when they first flew the SE5, uh, there were a couple of structural issues with it. And the first two prototypes were lost in flying accidents. And the pilot who I mentioned to you earlier, uh, Major Gooden, was sadly killed at Farnborough uh, flying one of the prototypes. So they made a few structural changes after that. I gather that they chopped off the wingtips. They made it a little bit uh, shorter span and uh, they also strengthened it as well because it was a structural failure that did for him. So it was the wing collapsing. So they, they improved the, uh, the strength of the aircraft. And that went on to be one of its, uh, excuse the pun, but one of its major strengths was the structural strength of the aircraft. Uh, this aircraft was able to dive very fast, both to attack other aircraft, and also when it got into trouble, it was able to, to dive away from trouble as well. And that, that was most of the other aircraft that was fighting at the time. Um, things like the Albatross, the Albatross 2 and the Albatross 3, they were, they were not able to match the speed of this aircraft here. I mean, it has been dived above 200 miles an hour, which for its, uh, you know, for its time as a World War I fighter um, was pretty impressive. 
Uh, other bits and pieces to know. So we've got a, um, this one was built by Wolseley, the car manufacturer. So built by Wolseley, as were a lot of aircraft in World War I. Um, it has a Wolseley Viper engine. So disputed whether it's 180 or 200 horsepower, but it's, it's of that, of that uh, sort of class. Um, a two-bladed fixed pitch propeller. And as I said, it's, it's very good performance for its time. And I would say, I'll, I'll come on to some of the details, but flying this aircraft, when you've flown others such as the Bristol Fighter, as I did, I flew the Bristol Fighter before I flew this, um, it, it's a world apart in terms of its handling. It's a much more sophisticated aircraft. It is, it's stable. It's very stable. Lots of World War I aircraft, they're, they're unstable. What does that mean? That means if you take your hands and feet off of the controls, they will diverge. It's impossible to get them trimmed and take your hands and feet off for a particular speed. They will just go away from you and eventually they'll just either, they'll, they'll tuck in, they'll pull up, they'll pitch down, they'll go sideways. Whereas this thing, you can actually trim it for a speed and take your hands off, not your feet so much, but you can take your hands off and it, and it can fly straight and level at a particular speed. Uh, it has been said that this aircraft was designed by engineers in a factory, you know, using slide rules and equations and um, technical drawings, unlike some of the previous aircraft, which were designed by furniture and bicycle manufacturers who had seen a picture of an aircraft somewhere, threw a few bits together and said, what is this, you know, I wonder how this will work. And I think that's reflected in, in what it's like to fly. Um, it actually handles like a, a modern aircraft. The first time I flew it, I couldn't believe it was, uh, you know, 1916 design, 1917, 18. It's, uh, it's, it's a class above the others. Uh, I have not yet flown any of the rotary aircraft, such as the Bristol uh, monoplane, uh, the 504K, uh, or the PUP here. But I, as I said, I have flown the, the inline engines, so the, um, the Bristol F2B and this thing, and this thing handles like a modern aircraft. And that's confirmed by people like Dodge Bailey I've spoken to who have flown all of them, who said absolutely it is. So when this thing came into service, it was first delivered uh, to France in about April 1917. And it, by all accounts, it was a bit of a revelation. The problem was they couldn't get enough of them. There was this supply problem. So they only really ramped up in late 17 and into early 18. And when they did, it was very, very successful. One of the reasons it was as successful as it was is because it was because of that ease of flying it. Um, I, I gather that the accident rate for pilots flying these was dramatically lower than it was for the aircraft that went before it. And that's largely because it is, um, it's such a, a peach to fly it. So bits and pieces to talk about. There's lots of things to talk about, but if you look at the basic shape of the aircraft, this was one of the smallest World War, you know, World War I fighters, or smaller World War I fighters. Makes it very sprightly. Um, the pilot sits about halfway back along the fuselage, if you look. Uh, that was done quite deliberately. You'll also see the stagger on the wings to put the top wing forward as well. That went to help the, uh, the field of view, the visibility of the pilot for looking around. Bear in mind, it's a fighter. One of the most important things is to be able to see other enemy aircraft. So where you sit, and you actually sit quite high as well. Um, you, if you see the pilots flying it, your, your head sits, you know, you're well, you're well up here, um, which puts you out in the blast. Um, but it also gives you a, a nice field of view to look around and see enemy aircraft. Um, we've got the armament we, we better talk about. So it's got two guns. It's on top of the wing there on the top. You see the Lewis gun, the machine gun, and that, that sliding rail it's on is called a Foster mount. And that was for a couple of reasons. One, it's the way that you pull the, you pull the gun down towards you to reload. You see it's got the, um, the round magazine on top. It's a 56 round magazine. It's a 303 gun, machine gun, uh, fired by a cable within the cockpit. Oh, it's got a spade grip, a round spade grip, and on top there are two levers. And when you push those, what, each of those levers fires one of the guns. So that's the Lewis gun on top. The secondary advantage that that mount gave, and if any of you know, have heard about um, Albert Ball, one of the famous World War I aces, one of the things that he was keen to do, and he'd been called down, by the way, he'd been, after his success in the Newports, he'd been called down as a consultant to Farnborough to advise them, and it was his opinion that they had to fit this thing with a Foster mount. What he liked doing was pulling it down to an intermediary position and then sneaking up below the enemy and then firing up into their belly, um, sometimes before, they'd, before he'd ever been seen, uh, which was quite a successful tactic as well. So that's the, uh, that's the Lewis gun, and that one fires above 
the arc of the propeller. So it's got a much faster rate of fire than the other gun that I'll tell you about in a moment. Magazines were carried uh, inside the cockpit. There's one, there's one in the uh, instrument panel itself, and there's also one under the seat, but the stories tell of them carrying them wherever they could, stuff down their shirts or um, anywhere else they could put them. But plenty of uh, ammo for that one. Now the second gun is the one that you can see, if I just point to it here, with the sight coming off it, they're just above the fuselage there, and that one's the Vickers gun. Uh, same caliber, 303 machine gun, but that one fires through the propeller arc uh, using an interrupter gear. So that's great, it puts it nice and close to the pilot's eye line, and you know, all, all those logistics of reloading it and pulling it down, and they, they all go away, but it actually gives it a, a slower rate of fire, and actually they were less reliable as well. That interrupter gear from time to time did fail. Some of you may be aware of the story of Max Zimmerman, famous ace, and uh, it's disputed, but there's a story that he, you know, what did for him was the uh, interrupter gear failing and him shooting off his own propeller. So that takes that problem away. You've got two different sights. You've got the kind of bead sight for the Vickers gun, and you've got the, uh, this sight in here, which you can look straight through. And when we're displaying the aircraft, it's great fun looking through that sight there at you lot as we're, um, as we're, as we're pointing down towards you to sight you up before breaking away. So. And it's, it's such a lovely aircraft to display because it's so manoeuvrable, it's so nimble. It's got a single throttle, just like a modern conventional aircraft, as opposed to the two levers, the fuel and air lever that you've got in the rotary engine. So engine handling is really straightforward. It's got a pretty reasonable rate of roll. And as I said, it's, it's, it's nice and stable and easy to fly. The only difficulty really with flying this aircraft is landing it. Now, some of you probably know that you know, that's the case for the vast majority of aircraft at the Shuttleworth. But this one in particular is a, is a little monkey to land. And that's largely because of the, you see the angle that it sits at on the ground. So when we're coming in to land, we have to kind of replicate this right at touchdown. So you have to hold the aircraft just above the runway and you have to pull back on the stick, let the speed wash off. And you're trying to get to this, what we call this attitude. So this picture, just as you land. So the very last thing we do before we get airborne is have a look at the horizon and find some feature where it cuts the aircraft. So in, in the case, as I recall, it's sort of along somewhere around this site there. So when, when the, the horizon is level with that site, then you've replicated this picture. And you also need to remember how high you are. And you can see I'm not far away from my kind of standing height. So you're trying to make that picture look exactly the same as you're coming into land. Now that sounds pretty straightforward. The problem is, as you are coming into land and you're bringing the throttle back to idle, just as you're approaching the flare and the touchdown, the drag on this thing starts to rise markedly. And it, and it will fall, and it's happened to me once, if you misjudge it slightly and you're even a few feet above the ground, it will just fall out the sky. Uh, because you're touching down almost at the stall, you're almost, the aircraft's almost stalled as you touch down. So you have to be quite precise with it. If you don't quite make it to three points and you land on the main wheels first, the momentum as the main wheels hit takes the tail down let's go it this way, takes the tail down, and as the tail goes down, then it gets airborne again. And if you're not, if you're unlucky, you end up in this kind of switchback motion between the main wheels and the tail wheels. And the front axle there, if you look, is not very well sprung. So it can be quite a hard ride. So if that happens, all we do is throttle idle and stick hard back in your lap and hold it. But if you bounce it too hard, it's said that the, the chances of a successful go around in this are pretty low. So you kind of get one go at it, really. Um, so you've got to get it right. And of course, you know, 19 year old kids were flying these things, yes, but uh, they used to lose a lot of them as well. And we've only got one and she's priceless. And so we have to look after her. And that's why sometimes we make difficult decisions not to fly them. We, of course, we want to show them to you, but you know, the, the number one thing here is this is a priceless museum exhibit and we're the temporary custodian of it. And the most important thing is to make sure she remains safe to show her off next time. So that's why Sometimes it might lead to disappointment, but it's always a decision based on uh, looking after the aircraft. We can't talk about this aircraft without talking about its wartime history. So this particular aircraft, it had always been said, if you read any old Shuttleworth books, or if you were here you know, several years ago, or a number of years ago, you would have heard that this aircraft didn't see wartime service and uh, was only used after the war and was used by Major Jack Savage in his sky writing um, business. Well, it, there was some investi investigation work done a few years ago. I think it was about three years ago now. Um, somebody discovered something in the records and they went and checked it with the Air Historic Branch 
and the RAF Museum at Hendon and they've managed to confirm that actually this aircraft did see wartime service and it was actually delivered to 84 Squadron in France right at the end of World War I and the fantastic thing about this aircraft is on, on the very last day of World War I before the armistice on the 10th of November 1918 uh, this actual airframe um, shot down the German Fokker D7. So this, this aircraft is a genuine World War I warbird with, with a kill um, in the hands of Major Pickthorn who was the commanding officer uh, of 84 Squadron at the time. So the aircraft is painted in the markings of Major Pickthorn and we were delighted to see his family um, come down a couple of years ago and we were able to show them around it, get them sitting in it and that must have been quite moving for them. Um, particularly the, the lady was there, I think it was, uh, I think it was her, um, Major Pickthorn's granddaughter. So that was very nice. So I'll probably stop there. I'm the duty pilot today, giving the brief in half an hour. So I think I'm going to have to wrap things up. Um, thanks very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed that. And I'll see you around. Enjoy the show. Thank you very much. Thanks.